Hey guys, we are back at it with What's His Face, and I'm gonna read 10, 11, and 12 today. Chapter 10 Four Full Mississippis. Starting on Monday morning, rehearsals are scheduled for 8 o'clock sharp, an hour before school. Cooper catches the early bus rather than walking, and no one appreciates this change more than Roddy. Of all modern advantages over the 16th century, the ghosts considers the primrose hued carriage without the horses the most spectacular with the possible expectations of TV and chia pets. Would that my poor father could experience these wonders, Roddy comments through the earbud as Cooper stands at the corner. He never lived to his experiments bear fruit. Oh, the carriage approacheth. Prepare thyself, Cooper Vega. As the big vehicle roars at the street, Cooper aims a GX4000's camera and snaps a picture. Roddy's translucent form whooshes out of the phone and makes for the bus in a shimmering swan dive. For an instant, he's sitting, jaunty and transparent on the hood, beaming back at Cooper, while the driver blinks in confusion. Then, in a swirl of mist, Roddy is drawn back into the phone, chortling his glee via the earbud. These brief jumps outside the phone have become a ritual between them. Cooper worries that people might notice a Roddy spectator out in the world. But the whole thing is over so quickly that nobody recognizes the sparkling cloud as anything other than a wisp of mist or a splash of light. Besides, it's Roddy's favorite thing. The ghost had such a crummy life, how can Cooper deny him this little bit of fun? Glorious, Roddy sighs. Tis almost like being alive again, methinks. No problem, Cooper replies. It is just his imagination or are those jumps getting longer every time. He could swear this one lasted four full Mississippis. The door folds open and Cooper climbs aboard the bus. The first face he sees belongs to Aiden, obnoxious Brock's obnoxious sidekick. He draped over one of the rear seats surrounded by a few of his buddies from the soccer team. Hey, check it out. What's his face? He tells his friends. Roddy's voice is full of urgency. Thou must not allow thyself to be addressed thus. It prevents thee from becoming cool. What am I supposed to do about it? Cooper whispers behind his hand. Speak these words, Roddy orders. What's his face thou might name me, but had my rat hound thy face? I should shave its hindquarters and train it to present itself rearward. I can't tell him that, Cooper hisses. Say it. Cooper turns to face the soccer player struggling to translate Roddy's flowery words into 21st century English. What are you looking at, Aiden challenges. I may be what's his face, Cooper shoots back, but if my dog had your face, I'd shave its butt and teach it to walk backward. There's a shock silence, and then Aiden's soccer friends burst into laughter. Laughter. Aiden sits open mouth a moment longer before joining in. He th reaches his fist into the aisle, and for an instant, Cooper thinks he's about to get punched. It takes a few seconds for him to realize that he's being invited to fist bump. Good one, kid, Aiden says approvingly as they knuckle tap. Roddy, it worked, Cooper mumbles once he's sure the bus engine's noise covers his voice. The ghost issues a satisfied, mm-hmm. Brock gets on to the next stop. Hey, everybody, it's Romeo, he bellows. Wherefore art me as he lumbers to the back to join the team. He makes a point of elbowing Cooper in the side. Morning, loser. Cooper listens for the next instructions from his ghostly friend, but the earbud is silent. That morning, Cooper finally gets a chance to speak one line, and he blows it. Instead of, here's, Romeo, here's Romeo's man, we found him in the churchyard, he says. Here's the church man, we found him in Romeo's yard. It gets screened from the rest of the cast, and his fa face is bright red. Cooper wonders if it'll ever live that down. Sorry, he mumbles. I can train my budgie to say it, Brock crows, and he'd get it right. Speak thus, Rody orders. My mind worketh not while list low hangeth the sun in the eastern sky. I guess I'm not a morning person, is Cooper's translation. He gets a smattering of applause and a lot of sympathetic nods from the rest of the seventh grade. Roddy always seems to know exactly what to say. How can a kid who died more than four centuries ago understand more about surviving middle school than a real middle schooler? As the day goes on, Cooper needs the earbuds in and his mind open to any advice his ghostly friend might have to offer. Things go smoothly until science class when, by sheer luck, his lab partner of the days turned out to be Joel Lee. Roddy's enthused. Fortune hath smiled upon thee, Cooper Vega. Thou must say this to her. Thy beauty shineth as bright as the star, lighting up the sky. Book says we need a Bunsen burner, Cooper tells her. Ah, well and good, Roddy says impatiently. Now speak of her beauty. 
Cut it out. Cooper murmurs into his hand. No, not you, Jolie. I was clearing my throat. She's gazing at him, perplexed, a look that suits her well. She pulls her lab coat tartar around the Carlsbad spelunking club t-shirt. Okay, what chemicals do we need? Roddy continues to nag as the two select various powders and liquids from the shelving, according to the experiment instructions. His tone changes as Jolie lists the various compounds they've collected. Methinks I know this, Cooper Vega. This experimentation was first performed by my own father. Thou shalt ennoble thyself greatly in the eyes of thy lady love. She's not my lady love, Cooper snarls when Jolie's away at the teacher's desk to get their experiment planned initialed. And what do you mean, ennoble myself? This enterprise brought great acclaim upon my father, the ghost insists. No offense, but it also gets him rested as warlock, Cooper reminds him. Roddy dismisses this. Thou speakest of a different matter. Dost thou not want fair Jolie to think of more clever than a buffoon? Well, yeah. Then do exactly as I instruct thee. Increase threefold the amount of brimstone. Brimstone, Cooper hisses. This is a middle school. We don't have brimstone. It is called sulfur. My father described it as a prince among all the elements. Cooper's a little reluctant. He can't deny the ghost has been a big help so far. There's already speculation in the seventh grade that Jolie's bound to fall for Brock just because of the roles they're playing. Cooper's sure not going to steal any of attention as a second watchman. How can he pass up the chance to make a big impression here? He takes their measuring spoon, adds two large scoops to their mixture, and stirs quickly so the yellow sulfur is mixed in with the other chemicals. Jolie returns with a signed experiment book. I hope he got all the measurements right. Trust me, he assures her. Okay, all the groups are good. To go. Fire up the Bunsen burner. Okay, Mrs. and Natalie announces. All the groups are good to go. Sorry, I just read that. <laughs> Cooper snares the beaker with tongs and holds it over the flame. How come ours is bubbling so much more than everybody else's, Jolie wonders. Cooper's about to reply when there's a percussive foom. A flash momentarily blinds everyone in the lab. And when Cooper blinks the dots out of his vision, he sees a plume of yellow and black smoke pouring out of the beaker, filling the room from ceiling downward. Hey, Brock points, check out what's his face. That's when the settling for reach fog reaches everybody's nostrils. The stench of rotten eggs is overpowering. Cooper gags and drops the tongs. The beaker shatters on the floor. Athletic Jolie leads the stampede for the door and the odor follows them out of the hall. Is it not glorious? Roddy demands in Cooper's ear. In an answer, Cooper edges his phone out of his pocket, giving the ghost a first-hand view of the students, doubled over and gasping as smoke pours out of the lab. Mayhap not. Mrs. and Natalie shuts the door, hoping to trap most of the smell inside. It looks like someone went a little heavy on the sulfur. What's his face made a stink bomb, Brock crows. The first thing Cooper sees through his streaming eyes is Jolie glaring at him. Chapter 11. Go big or go home. If there's anything stranger than the voice of a ghost in your ear, it's having that ghost droning on you and on about apologies... Oh, Cooper Vega, I do not blame thee, thou shalt hate me. I don't hate you, Cooper says. I hate myself because I was not smart enough to listen to you. Tis possible I mistook. Perchance my father said less brimstone, not more. What was your first clue? The fact that the whole school is going to reek like rotten eggs for next month and everybody's blaming me? Mayhap that is a good thing? No longer that shalt thou be called what's-his-face? Now thou shalt be known as he who hath stunk out the school. You're hilarious, Roddy. I can't get haunted by a normal ghost. Mine has to be 16th century comedian. I seek only to cheer thee, Roddy tells him. Yeah, well, cheer somebody else next time, Cooper snaps, and stop apologizing. I have to go to math class, and I can't concentrate with you in my head, whining about how you're not worthy. The ghost apologizes all through math and social studies, too. After school rehearsal, Roddy rattles off excuses about the difficulty of recalling exactly how much brimstone went into the experiment. That happened more than 400 years in the past. They're working on Act 1, Scene 5, where Romeo and Juliet share their first kiss, so Jolie and Brock spend the entire hour with their faces half an inch apart. To Cooper's relief, they never actually do kiss, but Jolie is 100% in character. Either that or she is really developing a crush on Brock. For Cooper, that would be unthinkable. As for Brock, he performs the entire scene with a cup with a cake-eating grin on his face and is instantly looking around to make sure the entire seventh grade is watching. 
he bursts out with, where for art me, or it is the East and Juliet is a babe whenever he senses not enough people are paying attention. I cannot live with this in Roddy's comment. Good thing you died in 1596, Cooper murmurs back. After rehearsal, Cooper comes upon Jolie taking off her sneakers and lacing on rollerblades for the trip home. His phone is out, so Roddy spots her too. Cooper Vega, that is thy opportunity to plead for her forgiveness. Cooper's annoyed because it works so well for your dad. I implore thee, go to her and express thy remorse with a pure heart before she becomes the consort of the buffoon. Cooper has had more than enough of apologies for one day, but the consort of the buffoon comment really hits home. He calls to, he calls to Jolie. Sorry about before. Science class, the Big Bang. Jolie cocks an eyebrow. What's in a name? That which we call a stink bong by any other name would smell like what Cooper and I set off in the lab. It's a riff on one of Juliet's lines that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. A good sign, he decides. If she's making jokes about it, she probably isn't so mad anymore. I guess I went a little heavy on that brimstone, he admits. I mean, sulfur. In his eyes, the ghost is frantic. Thou art not sorry enough, throw thyself at her feet, ear the wheels of her slippers, carry her away forever. Confess that thy love is so great that thou hast lost all reason, and thine only thought was to impress her with a mastery of science. Jolie stands up on her rollerblades. Anyway, see you tomorrow? Wait, Cooper blurts out. I'm sorry. You said that. No big deal. I mean, totally sorry. I was trying to impress you with how great I was at science, only I wasn't as great at science as I thought I was. I feel bad that you had to suffer for my mistake. She meets his eyes with an earnest gaze. Wow, that's really honest. Bravo, Cooper Va Vega, Roddy cheers in Cooper's ear. The kids in this town, Jolie goes on, they're nice and all that. And I have a lot of friends, but I can't shake the feeling that nobody says what they mean. That's what I like about the play. Romeo and Juliet don't care about what other people think. They're just honest with each other. Tell her that she hath placed her delicate finger upon the veritable truth, Roddy urges. I agree, says Cooper. I know people around here think I'm weird because I rock climb and bungee and parkour, she admits, but that's being honest too, honest with myself. I love the thrill that I get from extreme sports, the excitement, the fact that there's danger. I get kind of a rush out of that. Excellent, Roddy chimes in. Now thou must say, thou verily loud, thou lovest thee things as much as she. Cooper hesitates. This whole conversation started with her admiring his honesty. Why would he follow that up with lying to her? Of course he doesn't love us these things as much as she. He hates these things and all things where a guy could break us his neck. Say it, righty order. Say thou shalt be by her side in these amusements. Or as surely as night follows day, the buffoon shall be there in thy place. Begin to sweat. Cooper faces out the words, me too. She seems surprised. Really, I had you pegged as kind of the cautious type. Not me, Cooper assures her. Go big or go home. That's my motto. Great, she exclaims. What are you doing on Saturday? Thou shalt follow her about as an adoring mongrel, worshipping her beauty and hungry for every glance. Roddy prods. I think I'm free that day, Cooper translates. My family's going to Adventureland, but my brother's too little for any of the rides. I have to go on all the roller coasters by myself. No longer shalt thou suffer so, the ghost proclaims. Cooper gulps. I'll go with you. Awesome. See you Saturday. And she zooms off, taking long, confident strides on her rollerblades. Most excellent, Cooper Vega, Roddy declares, immensely pleased. Pray, what is a roller coaster? Cooper rolls his eyes, leaving it to Roddy to sign him up for something when the stupid ghost doesn't even know what it is. It's kind of a carriage. Like a school bus? Roddy asks, hopefully. Smaller and open. And it takes you up and down these giant hills faster and faster until you don't know where your stomach is anymore. The ghost is amazed. And thou enjoyest this? I wouldn't know, Cooper snaps, because I've spent the last 12 years avoiding roller coasters. <sighs> Thanks a lot. To thy no self be true, Cooper Vega, Reddy chides. Wouldst thou have told her no? Methinks not. Cooper has to admit he's right. This is practically like being asked out by Jolie Solomon. A roller coaster ride is a small price to pay to spend a whole Saturday with her. Chapter 12, The Loose Nuke. Adventureland is Stratford's own amusement park. Not quite Six Flags level, but a world-class attraction on the edge of town, not far from the Wolfson estate. 
The plan is to meet there around one o'clock. Cooper makes sure to arrive 45 minutes early for some advanced scouting. He gets a ride from Veronica and her old her boyfriend, Cham Buttgarner, scanning the skyline of towering roller coaster tracks. Cooper can feel his early lunge climbing up his digestive tract. We'll have a good time, Veronica says dubiously. Stick to the merry-go-round, kid, is Chad's advice. They don't call that big roller coaster the loose nuke for nothing. Cooper isn't quite sure which of the three roller coasters is the loose nuke. The highest one with the near vertical drop or the loop-the-loop -loop one where half the ride is upside down or nothing. Or maybe Chad means the one where you're standing up strapped in like you've been chained to the wall for some medieval torture chamber. Roddy's first view of Adventureland is more positive. Never hath these eyes beheld such revelry and joy. Surely not even the royal tournaments could match this splendor. There isn't any jousting here either, so don't bother asking, Cooper tells him sourly. The closest thing is where you throw a baseball at milk bottles to win a giant stuffed banana. Cooper snaps a few pictures, not for the photos, but to allow Roddy a little exploration of their surroundings. In the bright sunshine, no one notices the shimmering ghostly form soaring above the crowd, checking out the various rides and games of chance. Cooper counts, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. The jumps are definitely getting longer. Roddy's up to eight and nine Mississippis, giving him enough time to insert himself into a Ferris wheel seat or pass right through the giant hammer at the Test Your Strength booth. His spectral form briefly blinds the contestant, who misses the target, and very nearly brings the mallet down on his own foot. By the time Roddy is sucked back into the GX4000, the man is involved in a heated argument with the booth operated, operator, demanding a free do-over because the glare got in his eyes. Cooper's curious. Do you choose how long you stay outside the phone, or do you just get pulled back in again? I know it isn't as urgent, tugging at my body, that I can resist not. How strange is I have no body. Cooper feels a pang of sympathy. It's easy to forget that Roddy's a prisoner in the GX4000, an exile from the distant past, and most tragic of all, long dead. Still for a dead guy, Roddy has a lot of fun that day. He floats through gigantic tufts of cotton candy and bats of lemonade until he can almost remember what taste tastes like. He hitchhikes on bumper cars, which are practically as good as jousting. He hovers in the middle of a tilt-a-whirl, peering into the riders' faces and trying to experience their excitement. He objects to the thousands of stuffed animals on display as prizes, but once Cooper explains that they aren't made from the carcass of real dogs, cats, and bears, he's okay with it. In fact, Roddy becomes obsessed with a ring-tossed tic-tac-toe, a contestant of great intricacy and skill. He refuses to stop nagging until Cooper has spent two-thirds of his money winning a gigantic plush unicorn bright pink. There, I've won it for you. Are you happy now? Cooper says in exasperation. It is a truly exquisite beast worthy of a duke. At least a duke has some place to put it, Cooper points out. You live in a phone. At the moment, the GX4000 pings for an incoming text. Maybe at Lou Snook, Jolie. The Lou Snook, why does it have to be that one? There's some nice, smaller roller coasters in Kittyland. No such luck. The sign in front of the loose nuke boasts that the main drop is as high as 25-story apartment building. Jolie is waiting there, a quiver with excitement, and despite everything, Cooper's delighted to see her. This isn't school where they both have no choice but to be there. It almost feels like a real date, just two of them. No dating is allowed. <laughs> just hang out. Be friends. Hey, check it out. What's his face and his chanted unicorn? An obnoxious voice booms over the carnival music. Brock appears out of the midway crowd, inhaling a hot dog in one titanic bite. Pink is definitely not your color, kid, he adds, mouthful. Hi, Brock. Jolie greets him far too brightly. I didn't know you were going to be here, Cooper says. Veronica told me where to find you, Brock exclaims. Knowing Jolie, I just went to the biggest, baddest roller coaster in the place because she's a total beast. Jolie glows. Cooper winces. How come this guy can remember Veronica's name, but I'm still what's-his-face? The worst part is Jolie invites Brock to go with them on the ride. So not only does Cooper have to go on the deadliest roller coaster in three states, but doesn't even get to sit next to Jolie. Brock steals a seat between the two of them, so Cooper's squashed between beefy Brock on one side and the stuffed unicorn on the other. Cooper has spent a lot of time stressing over this roller coaster experience. It's a thousand times worse than being expected, and the, 
than he expected. And the only good thing about it is that he's jammed into his seat so tightly he can't possibly be flung out of the car to his death. First, the ride ratchets you up really slow, groaning all the way to a height unimaginable without a helicopter. And then you drop like a stone straight down. Cooper leans over to right to see Joel Lee, but Brock is in the way, howling at the top of his lungs and through it all. Roddy is shouting urgently into his earbud. What manner of suffering is this? Out thar be, art thou being tortured? At the very last second, the car swoops out of a free fall and climbs another hill for another drop. It goes on and on and never gets better. Cooper never gets used to it. Roddy had it right, he reflects. We are being tortured, yea, verily. Just when Cooper can't take it anymore, the car lurches to a stop, which is even more violent than the part that came before. Jolie jumps off the ride, flushed with pleasure. That was extreme. Cooper isn't sure he can move his rubbery legs until Brock pulls him out of the car, a unicorn in all. The soccer star wobbles down the ramp to the nearest trash can, bends over, and throws up his hot dog in a single heave. He wipes his mouth on his sleeve and roars, Let's go again! All Cooper wants to do is find a quiet place to lie down until his stomach drops out of his throat. But there's no way he's going to leave Joel Lee with this giant guy. This is Cooper's day after all. Brock just horned in on it thanks to Veronica's big mouth. So they go again and again and they ride the loose nuke four times. The cataclysm twice, the desic... <laughs> decapitator once <laughs> I don't know why that was such a hard word I'm like what decapitator once the cataclysm is so violent that the unicorn goes spinning off out of the car on one of the loop the loops Cooper's phone almost falls out in the last second he's able to snatch the GX 4000 out of the air but the unicorn is gone for good save me Cooper Vega what is this sorcery Roddy wills into the earbud at the end of the ride the ghost image on the screen looks a little pale Jolie's just suggesting that they go on the G-Force freefall parachute drop when her parents text her to meet them at the gate because it's time to go home. Cooper's never been so grateful for anything in his life. It was so awesome of you to meet me here, she exclaims, throwing her arms around Koopa, Koopa, <laughs> Cooper and hugging him. In the tiny perfect instant, two hours of nonstop terror, gut-wrenching nausea disappear in a puff of smoke. Then she spoils it by saying exactly the same thing to Brock and embracing him too. The two boys just stand side by side, watching her run off to meet her family. Don't even think about it, kid, Brock tells him once out of earshot. What are you talking about, Cooper demands. You know, Jolie. Hey, Cooper's angry. She asked me to come here today. You're the party crasher. Just remember who's Romeo and who's the loser with one line in Act 5. They part definitely not as friends. When Cooper takes out his phone to text Veronica for a ride home, Roddy's there to greet him. A triumphant day, Cooper Vega. Yeah, sure. You're not the one who's about to barf up every meal he ate back to the last of February. Well, worth the sacrifice, Roddy insists. Would not Barnabas gladly exchange some small suffering to be near his beloved Ursula? Barnabas died, Cooper reminds him. Maybe not on a roller coaster, but it still counts. So it's Romeo who died thanks to be that thief Shakespeare, the ghost corrects him. Barnabas was to win the love of his fair lady and live in bliss ever and anon. I don't think that's going to happen with me, Cooper explains. Complains. You heard Brock. He's after Jolie big time and he's got the inside track because she's Juliet, he's Romeo, and I'm what's-his-face. Roddy looks out to him, his expression solemn. Hear me thou shalt also learn the part of Romeo. What for, Cooper asked dejectedly. I'm second watchman. I can't even get that right. Brock is a naughty pated wits to let. He is unfit for a role such as Romeo, who will fail and thou shalt become his replacement. Thus will Jolie be drawn to thee. Tis foolproof. Cooper stares at the ghost, excuse me, on the screen. Okay, Brock isn't a natural actor like Jolie, but he's doing a halfway decent job as Romeo. How can Roddy be so sure that he's going to drop out? There's an even bigger problem with the ghost plan. How am I supposed to learn all of Romeo's lines? I won't get any rehearsal time because it's not my part. Thou dost forget, Cooper Vega. I wrote that play. No one knoweth Romeo better than I. I shall teach thee. All right. See you next time. That was chapter 10 through 12.